Thank you for joining us, Michael Hinojosa, uh, former former superintendent of Dallas ISD and and uh, a longtime friend and and looking forward to hearing you speak to some of the the strategies and ways in which you can support superintendents as they move forward in their career and. Um, we're here to, to listen and, and certainly take some Q&A at the end. But uh, Michael, if you could give a, just an intro for yourself and, and then take it away. First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to um, give you a little bit of a wisdom that I discovered along the way. Um, first of all, um, I've been a superintendent, uh, retired last year. I was a superintendent for 27 years. Um, and um, but I, I was a student in Dallas. I grew up in Dallas and Try wanted to be a coach all my life, but I got kicked upstairs in the administration. I went from um, from a, from a teacher and a coach to an assistant principal in a suburban district, and that was much of a surprise to me. Then I got the itch to be a superintendent, and so I had to go the route of going to a small district first to learn the superintendency, and then work my way up to two of the twenty five largest districts in America. Thus, in that process, I was a suburban superintendent. This was my third superintendency when I finally discovered the leadership triangle or the success triangle or whatever you want to call it. And to me, that was the secret sauce. And so I'm going to describe what that secret sauce is now. This, um, And I learned this from a veteran superintendent. Uh, when I went to a suburban Houston district, I followed two great superintendents. Before that, I had kind of been the fix-it man, and I've discovered that I like fixing things that are not working. But when I was there, and that was a stable three years for me, I had an opportunity to visit with a lot of people. And there was a gentleman who had been superintendent there for 13 years. And he taught me the, this about this triangle. And the triangle that he was referring to is a leadership triangle, a success triangle, and something that I never forgot. And I wish I'd have learned it when I was a young superintendent, when I was a baby superintendent. And now I teach it to everybody that'll listen to me. And this triangle is in the middle of this triangle of the students. And in public education, we are responsible for the students. And we are responsible for people's two most prized possession, their money and their students and their kids. So the responsibility is huge. Fixing a budget is linear. Fixing student achievement is not linear. There are a lot of moving parts, a lot of things you have to do. But what I discovered about this leadership triangle, he said that at the top of that triangle is the school board. They're elected officials. They're your bosses and you're not their boss. And by the way, they're all different. And for the first time in your life, you're going to get evaluated by people who have not been trained like you have been trained. These are people who are elected officials and they're going to be there for three or four years typically. And so um, a lot of superintendents underestimate the importance of the top of the triangle. Um, they are your bosses and they are all different. In Dallas, I was superintendent in Dallas for 13 years. In all 13 years, we had three black, three white, three brown board members. And every year, one of them was up for re-election. And every year, they would say, please don't do anything controversial in the spring. Well, everything we did in the spring was controversial. Budgeting, staffing, hiring. So, But you got to understand their world. And so they're at the top of the triangle. At one corner of the triangle is the staff. And the staff is very important. You cannot execute a any idea or initiative without your team. And the staff is also very critical and there are all kinds of diversity in your staff. You have your direct reports, which you are hunkered down with and you spend a lot of time with your direct reports, but you also have people in the field. You have teachers who are your most important commodity, but you also have, in Dallas, we had 20,000 employees. Uh, and so it's very important that you understand how you work with your staff. And at the bottom of the triangle, the third part of the triangle was the community. And the community is very diverse. You have business leaders. You have community activists. You have people. You have taxpayers who do not have 
students in your school. And so what I learned about this triangle is that I had to spend time in all parts of that triangle. And so I was very intentional. In fact, my calendar was color coded. Thursdays were board meeting days. So every Thursday was, I spent time with the board. And then on, when we don't have board meetings, I made sure that I, I went to lunch with every board member individually. I met regularly with the board president at least once a month. Um, at least every other month, I would have lunch with the board members. I learned from a mentor that he said, you know, also board members hire the ones they like and fire the ones they don't. If you're likable, they'll overlook your mistakes. If you're a jerk and you're not very likable, they're going to look at every expense report. They're going to look at every email and they're going to find something to pin you on. I also had retreats with my board every quarter. I also got to know them individually, what kind of personality style was. One board member would always ask questions. It's not that she didn't trust us. She was an analytical. That's how she made decisions. Another one was wanted to be in every photo op. And we made fun of him that he was kind of shallow. Well, actually, he was our champion. He was out there telling everybody the, all the good stuff that we were doing. And and then so sometimes people, uh, other people are drivers. They want results right now. So if you don't understand the style of your bosses, then you can't manage up. So I was very intentional. So Thursdays were board meeting days. And even I met, uh, we, we would plan that uh, deliberately. Wednesdays. And Mondays were staff days. Monday, every every Monday afternoon for an hour, I met with all my chiefs of all of my divisions. And we sat around a table and we went double round robin. Where do we need each other? What are you working on that we need to support each other? And we go around twice and I would say where I need them so we could finish each other's sentences. Cause, and we started our meeting at 137 and it was over an hour. And nobody was late. Everybody was there at 1.30, so we could start at 1.37, take care of our business, and everybody goes their way. Every other Monday, I had a, an expanded version of that team, which I call the executive leadership team, which I had the best principal and the best um, uh, principal supervisor where we got to plan the important stuff. And we had an agenda ahead of time, so we got to have an opportunity. So Mondays were like my staff days. Wednesdays were also staff days. For 27 years, I went to campuses. So people would say, why would you go to a campus? And why Wednesday? I said, well, because I need to see what's going on. I need to, I'm need i not going there to supervise. I'm going there to understand what the district is about. And they said, well, why Wednesday? I said, because I'm an optimistic person. And Wednesday is hump day. I want to see people at their best. And so uh, I said, if you want to be upset, go to a high school on a Friday afternoon. Um, and because you're not going to see a lot of high quality instruction on a Friday afternoon because that's human nature. People are getting ready for the weekend. But to me, that always paid off. And when I'd go to a school on Wednesday, I would drive around the campus to see the grounds. I'd walk in and meet the secretary. I'd walk in and I shake the hands of the custodian and go, go to the cafeteria and say hello to the cafeteria workers. And all this time I'm building momentum with staff. And getting to know it, I appreciate that. And then on um, the uh, Thursdays, I mean on Wednesdays and Fridays and any other time, I spent time in the community. Um, and the community is very diverse. You have your business executives, you have taxpayers, you have community activists. And so you need to make sure that you understand who these people are and how you spend time with them. And every time I took over a school district, I listened to 100 people in 100 days, and I asked them five questions. The first three questions were about initiatives, what they needed to work on. Question number four was, who are the most respected people on staff? And so I would find out who in the district everybody respected. I never took anybody with me to every district that I went to. I always figured out how to find the talent. And then talent identification was important, talent Development was important and talent promotion was important. And a lot of those names I learned my very first 100 days in the district because mm -hmm. these were the people that were respected. Now, uh, then the question number five is, who are the external stakeholders that are critical to our future success? And I wrote those names down. 
And those names changed over time. But I got to know who the people were in the community that I had to spend quality time with to get to understand. In my career, we passed over $8 billion worth of bonds to help improve facilities for students. And I did that by getting to know who are the important people. In some communities that are big, have multiple municipalities, you had multiple mayors, you had to figure out who were the players that really had the most influence. In other districts, and I was in charge of a county district. That was completely different. But I've also um, had a good relationship with every mayor in the city of Dallas. If you're the superintendent of a namesake city like Dallas, you better have a relationship with the mayor because it will pay off hugely for your school district. So going back and summarizing, what I learned was it was very important to listen. It was very important to have a strategy. It was very important to be organized. Um, and so people say, how in the world did you do that? And, I, and you did that for 27 years and 13 in Dallas. And people people scoff when I say that I worked an average of 45 hours a week. Um, that's because I didn't micromanage people. I hired great people. I held them accountable and I let them do their jobs. Um, and I would, they would come in and I would tell them, look, if I have to make all the decisions, why do I need you? And so you, if you hire smart, if you hire people who are hungry, humble and smart, and then you hold them accountable and you let them do their job, it's amazing what they will deliver for you. And I'm an optimistic person. And so I believe in people, and but I also believe that it's my job to develop them and support them. Forty-seven people who have worked with me have become superintendents because part of my job was to train them as a principal who was on the executive leadership team and then saw they could get a promotion to central office, and then now many of them became superintendents. So you have to be deliberate in your strategy. You have to be disciplined. It takes a lot of discipline to follow those systems. And I did that same playbook everywhere I went. And, and so when I left Dallas the first time and came back and they said, how is Inohosa 2.0 any different? I said, I don't know. I'm the same guy. It's just the people that used to hate me don't hate me as much. So, But it, I ran the same playbook. I, and But by being intentional, disciplined people with disciplined thought, taking disciplined action, can overcome almost any challenge. So that is what I mean uh, um, about having, um, you know, being disciplined, believing in people, believing in students. And then if you have these systems that you put together, they really will help you execute whatever plan you have to do. What I just described to you is true for superintendency. It's also true for a principalship. Um, Cause I tell them, you're not the superintendent, it's the superintendency. It's the people you involve yourself with. You're not the principal, it's the principalship. It's the people that help you. By the way, the principal has community, they have staff, and we're their bosses. The central office is their boss. And so it applies to schools. And I bet in most businesses, they have their version of the triangle. But as a school executive uh, for so many years, I know that's what worked for me. And I was so glad that I stumbled into it. But now I teach this to everybody that'll listen to me. So thanks for listening to me. And I, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have about this or anything else, Todd. If you had to ascribe like a percentage um, for the, the superintendent between um, the work is more leadership or is it more management? It certainly would be both. And I know there's nuances, but do you, the way you've described it, one could take away that um, it's it's all about communications. It's all about consistency. As you said, the structure of the model is such that you become predictable. And, and that's a good thing. As a leader, you understand where the leader is taking the, the district with others, of course. But I, I'm just curious how you think of framing up the superintendent um, blending leadership and management, or is it more leadership, less management, or is that not a discrepancy or a, a distinction that needs to be made? It's a huge distinction, Todd. Thanks for surfacing it. Cause I had a beef with Stephen Covey. I didn't really know him. I met him a couple of times, but he, he said, it's all about leadership. 
And, and he says, don't focus on management. You got people to do that. Well, that's true to a significant extent. I would say that it's 80% leadership. But here's why management is very important. Um, there's, you, you can't be a leader unless you're trusted. And you can't be trusted. There's two types of trust. Technical trust and interpersonal trust. Everybody knows what interpersonal trust is. And that is, you know, I share something in confidence with you and I expect you to keep that confidence. Or you're a reliable person because of interpersonal relationships. Technical trust is even more important. That it means you can get the job done. If I give you an assignment and you blow it, how likely am I to give it to you again? Somebody gives me an assignment and I don't deliver. Are they going to trust me that I have the technical competence to handle it? So you cannot be a leader without management. Management is required, but it's not enough. So, yeah, 80 20, uh, I, I believe is 80 percent leadership, but 20 percent management. Just like having management is getting these systems in place so that you can execute. But then execution is the biggest part. That's the 80% of the job. And you execute by being visible, by seeing things. And when you've done it for a long time, you see patterns and you're not afraid of problems because that's what that's what they hired us to be is a problem solver, not a whiner. And so, um, but I think that that is a huge question that people underestimate and management is, is critically important, but it's certainly not enough. I, I tend to agree. And, and when you think of each part of the triangle, what is the hardest um, element to learn? Um, and I mean that from the standpoint of um, learning can be very, to your point, technical or book based. I can I can learn how to teach, but until I teach, I don't know whether I'm a great teacher or not. And over time and experience, you can build the teaching skills. So it's a little bit art, a little bit science, a little bit experience, a little bit um, rote learning. When you think of the superintendent approaching community, board, and staff, what's the hardest one to learn, you know, and what's the most appropriate way to learn it? Let me get to the hardest one in a moment. But they're all, this is a great question. The easiest one is the students and teaching because... 99% of superintendents started off as teachers. Um, and and we start off as teachers because we wanted to help kids, because we like kids, we like school. That's why we did this as, as a profession. So that's the easiest to learn. And, and sometimes we underestimate the importance of it. The second one is the community, because you always, as you work up the ranks, if you were a teacher or a coach, you got community to deal with. And that, and that one is nuanced, and and it depends on how much experience you have with it as to how well you do at it. Um, and believe it or not, you're going to be shocked, Todd, but I'm an introvert. So being, I have to push myself to be out. When I'm talking about public education, I'm an extrovert. When I'm talking about leadership, I'm an extrovert. When I'm at a party, I'm an introvert. I'm over in the corner by myself. You're going to have to push me to, to get me to talk because you know, I like my, I just like my downtime. Uh, the hardest by far is the board because they're not trained like you are. And two things helped me be a superintendent for 27 years. And a lot of people haven't had these experiences. Number one, I was a government teacher. So I understood politics and a lot of superintendents shy away from politics and it gets them in trouble. Now, they don't know, or they try to be a politician. Um, and, and so the politics of it is very hard. The second thing that also helped me was I was a basketball referee for seven years. Everybody's always yelling at you. So you cannot lose your mojo or your courage just because someone's yelling at you because they're going to have opinions, especially when you're dealing with their money and their kids. So I think those two things, I was very fortunate that I had experience and I'm a very disciplined, resilient guy. And a lot of people, they get their feelings hurt. Um, and I mean, and this job is tough. It's very rewarding. I love being a superintendent for 27 years, but it is tough. Don't, don't get me wrong. And I think the political element is, is the most, and because that's what board members are. They're elected officials. 
And, and the irony is the lowest voter turnout is in school board elections. So you're not even necessarily dealing with the true will of the community. It's the true will of the voters that voted. Um, and so somehow that is by far the most complex part of the job that a lot of great educators can't do well and they don't last. And, and especially now at times we've gotten pretty tough. To, to take some of your points here, like if it's the political aspect, that's one of the hardest parts to learn. Um, and you kind of need to learn on, on the job, so to speak, through experience, then do you want to move from teacher to principal to director of communications or something along those lines? Is it is it worthwhile being you know, head of the, the uh, teachers union, for example, to, to experience those types of negotiations? What, what, what kind of roles do you, do you believe contribute to preparing a superintendent for that superintendent role? Well, you're reading my mind because that's what I'm doing now, preparing superintendents, and I'm, and I'm teaching them. The traditional path is teacher, principal, principal supervisor, chief of school, superintendent. I didn't follow that path. I wasn't even a principal. I was an assistant principal for three years. But to your point, the best thing ever happened to me is I went to HR for seven years. I mean, I'm sorry, for four years. I went from assistant principal to assistant superintendent in four years. And the training I got in HR, is the, I use it every day for the rest of my career. Um, because you did, we're a labor-intensive organization. It's 85% of our money is tied up in people. And, and so that's the, the, the part that is very helpful. Uh, very few things in education are technical. Um, I believe that if you're hungry, humble, and smart, you can do about almost any job. Chief of schools, chief academic officer, chief of HR. The one that's very technical is finance. If you don't know government accounting, you can't do that job. Uh, if you're not, uh, uh, so that one is very technical. But let me just tell you, because of the question that you asked, I have designed this institute called the Michael Casterly Institute, and we you don't you don't get to a, apply for it. You have to be nominated. We only take 10 people. And here's the curriculum. Session one is board relations. Session two is media and politics. Session three is labor relations and talent management. Session four is community relations and performance management. It's not till session five that we get to academics. Because if you can't do those other things, you're not going to get to academics. And then session six is operations, finance, technology. And then a wrap-up session is about you know, equity and ethics and, and then what we call strength bombardment, building on people's strengths. So that is the curriculum that I've designed that I'm taking 10 people through right now. And I'm selecting, we are selecting the second cohort. Um, and if I look back five years from now, hopefully we would have trained 50 people that are ready to take on these big, tough urban jobs. I like to close all of my talks with three things, the past, the present, and the future. Um, the past, be proud of your past. We, I'm proud to be an immigrant. I'm proud to be from the inner city of Dallas uh, and never apologize for who you are or where you come from because your set of experiences have put you in that position right now. In the present, be present. Nothing great happens in the absence of enthusiasm. If you're not enthusiastic about what you do, how are you going to get other people inspired? And then the future, you know, some people, you know, are, are concerned about this climate change and this politics. Not me. I'm an optimistic person. I think any problem can be solved if you got the right people. And I always look to the future of hope and optimism. And I'm looking to the future of Dallas. Uh, because so many young people are going to be coming out with the skills to be very successful in the world of work. And so um, you got to live your attitude and your attitude determines your altitude. And I think um, that's why I, I, I have an aspirational goal uh, with everything that I do. So, but thanks for giving me an opportunity to share this with you. Thanks, Tom.